Chapter 11. But this was expensive. Take it easy, Arturo. Have you forgotten those oranges? I counted what was left. It was $20 in some cents. I was scared. I racked my brain over figures, added everything I had spent. $20 left, impossible. I had been robbed. I would misplaced the money. There was a mistake somewhere. I looked all over the room, burrowed into pockets and drawers, but that was all. And I was scared and worried and determined to go to work. Write another one quick. Something written so fast it had to be good. I sat before my typewriter and the great awful void descended. And I beat my head with my fists, put a pillow under my aching buttocks, and made little noises of agony. It was useless. I had to see her and I didn't care how I did it. I waited for her in the parking lot. At 11, she came around the corner and Sammy the bartender was with her. They both saw me from the distance and she lowered her voice when she got to the car. Sammy said, hi there. But she said, what do you want? I want to see you, I said. I can't see you tonight, she said. Make it later on tonight. I can't, I'm busy. You're not that busy, you can see me. She opened the car door for me to get out, but I did not move, and she said, please get out. Nothing doing, I said. Sammy smiled, her face flared. Get out, goddammit. I'm staying, I said. Come on, Camilla, Sammy said. She tried to pull me out of the car, seized my sweater, and jerked and tugged. Why do you act like this, she said. Why can't you see I don't want to have anything to do with you? I'm staying, I said. You fool, she said. Sammy had walked toward the street. She caught up with him and they walked away and I was there alone, horrified and smiling weakly at what I had done. As soon as they were out of sight, I got out and walked up the stairs of the flight and down to my room. I couldn't understand why I had done that. I sat on the bed and tried to push the episode out of my mind. Then I heard a knock on my door. I didn't get a chance to say come in because the door opened and I turned around and there was a woman standing in the doorway looking at me with a peculiar smile. She was not a large woman and she was not beautiful, but she seemed attractive and mature and she had nervous black eyes. They were brilliant. The sort of eyes a woman gets from too much bourbon, very bright and glassy and extremely insolent. She stood in the doorway without moving or speaking. She was dressed intelligently, black coat with a fur piece, black shoes, black skirt, and a white blouse and a small purse. Hello, I said. What are you doing, she said. Just sitting here. I was scared. The sight and nearness of that woman rather paralyzed me. Maybe it was the shock of seeing her so suddenly. Maybe it was my own misery at that moment. But the nearness of her and that crazy, glassy glitter of her eyes made me want to jump up and beat her, and I had to steady myself. The feeling lasted for only a moment, and then it was gone. She started to cross the room with those dark eyes, insolently watching me, and I turned my face toward the window, not worried by her insolence, but about that feeling which had gone through me like a bullet. Now there was the scent of perfume in the room, the perfume that floats after women in luxurious hotel lobbies, and the whole thing made me nervous and uncertain. When she got close to me, I didn't get up, but sat still, took a long breath, and finally looked at her again. Her nose was pudgy at the end, but it was not ugly, and she had rather heavy lips without robe, so that they were pinkish. But what got me were her eyes, their brilliance, their animalism, and their recklessness. She walked over to my desk and pulled a page out of the typewriter. I didn't know what was happening. I still said nothing, but I could smell liquor on her breath, and then the very peculiar but distinctive odor of decay, Swedish and cloying, the odor of oldness, the odor of this woman in the process of growing old. She merely glanced at the script. It annoyed her, and she flipped it over her shoulder, and it zigzagged to the floor. It's no good, she said. You can't write. You can't write at all. Thanks very much, I said. I started to ask her what she wanted, but she did not seem the kind who accepts the questions. I jumped off the bed and offered her the only chair in the room. She didn't want it. She looked at the chair and then at me, thoughtfully smiling, 
her disinterestedness in merely sitting down. Then she went around the room reading some stuff I had pasted on the walls. There were some excerpts I had typed from Mencken and from Emerson and from Whitman. She sneered at them all, poof, 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 making gestures with her fingers, curling her lips. She sat on the bed, pulled off her coat jacket to the elbows, and put her hands on her hips and looked at me with insufferable contempt. Slowly and dramatically, she began to recite, What should I be but a prophet and a liar, whose mother was a leprechaun, whose father was a friar? Teeth on a crucifix and cradled underwater. What should I be but the fiend's goddaughter? It was Malay. I recognized it at once, and she went on and on. She knew more Malay than Malay herself. And when she finally finished, she lifted her face and looked at me and said, That's literature. You don't know anything about literature. You're a fool. I had fallen into the spirit of the lines, and when she broke off so suddenly to denounce me, I was at sea again. I tried to answer, but she interrupted and went off in a very more manner, speaking deeply and tragically, murmuring of the pity of it, the stupidity of it all, the absurdity of a hopelessly bad writer like myself buried in a cheap hotel in Los Angeles, California, of all places, writing banal things the world would never read and never get a chance to forget. She lay back, laced her fingers under her head, and spoke dreamily to the ceiling. You will love me tonight, you fool of a writer. Yes, tonight you will love me. I said, say, what is this anyway? She smiled. Does it matter? You're nobody. And I might have been somebody, and the road to each of us is love. The sin of her was pretty strong now impregnating the whole room so that the room seemed to be hers and not mine. And I was a stranger in it. And I thought we had better go outside so she could get some of the night air. I asked her if she would like to walk around the block. She sat up quickly. Look, I have money, money. We will go somewhere and drink. Sure thing, I said. Good idea. I pulled on my sweater. When I turned around, she was standing beside me and she put the tips of her fingers on my mouth. That mysterious saccharine odor was so strong on her fingers that I walked toward the door and held it open and waited for her to pass through. We walked upstairs and through the lobby. When we reached the front desk, I was glad the landlady was gone to bed. There was no reason for it, but I didn't want Mrs. Hargraves to see me with this woman. I told her to tiptoe across the lobby, and she did it. She enjoyed it terribly. Like an adventure and little things, it thrilled her, and she tightened her fingers around my arm. It was foggy on Bunker Hill, but not downtown. The streets were deserted, and the sound of her he heels on the sidewalk echoed among the old buildings. She tugged my arm, and I bent down to hear what she wanted to whisper. You're going to be so marvelous, she said, so wonderful. I said, let's forget it now. Let's just walk. She wanted a drink. She insisted upon it. She opened her purse and waved a $10 bill. Look, money. I have lots of money. We walked down to Solomon's Bar on the corner where I played the pen games. Nobody was there but Solomon, who stood with his chin in his hands, worried about business. We walked to a booth facing the front window, and I waited for her to sit down, but she insisted I get in first. Solomon walked over for our order. Whiskey, she said. Lots of whiskey. Solomon frowned. A short beer for me, I said. Solomon was watching her sternly, searchingly, his bald spot crinkling from a frown. I could sense the consanguinity and knew that then she was Jewish too. Solomon went back for the drinks and she sat there with her eyes blazing, her hands folded on the table, her fingers twinning and untwinning. I sat trying to think of some way of dodging her. A drink will fix you up fine, I said. Before I knew it, she was at my throat, but not roughly. Her long fingernails and short fingers against my flesh as she had talked about my mouth, my wonderful mouth. Oh, God, what a mouth I had. Kiss me, she said. Sure, I said. Let's have a drink first. She clenched her teeth. Then you too know about me, she said. You're like the rest of them. You know about my wounds, and that's why you won't kiss me, because I disgust you. 
I thought she is crazy. I've got to get out of here. She kissed me, her mouth tasting of liverwurst on rye. She sat back, breathing with relief. I took out my handkerchief and wiped the sweat from my forehead. Solomon returned with the drinks. I reached for some money, but she paid quickly. Solomon went back for the change, but I called him back and handed him a bill. She fussed and protested, pounding her heels and fists. Solomon lifted his hands in a gesture of hopelessness and took her money. The moment his back was turned, I said, lady, this is your party. I've got to go. She pulled me down and her arms went around me and we fought until I thought it was absurd. I sat back and tried to think of another escape. Solomon brought back the change. I took a nickel from it and told her I'd like to play the pen game. Without a word, she let me pass and I got up and walked over to the machine. She watched me like a prize dog and Solomon watched her like a criminal. Then I went on the machine and I called Solomon to come over and check the score. I whispered, who is that woman, Solomon? He didn't know. She had been there earlier in the evening, drinking a great deal. I told him I wanted to go out the back way. It's the door on the right, he said. She finished her whiskey and hammered the table with the empty glass. I walked over, took a sip of beer, and told her to excuse me a minute. I jerk, jerked my thumb toward the men's room. She patted my arm. Solomon was watching me as I took the door opposite the men's room. It led to the storeroom, and the door to the alley was a few feet behind. As soon as the fog smothered my face, I felt better. I wanted to be as far away as possible. I wasn't hungry, but I walked a mile to the hot dog stand on 8th Street and had a cup of coffee to kill time. I knew she would go back to my room after she missed me. Something told me she was insane. Could have been that she had too much liquor, but it didn't matter. I didn't want to see her again. I got back to my room at two in the morning. Her personality and the mysterious smell of old age still possessed it, and it was not my room at all. For the first time, its wonderful solitude was spoiled. Every secret of that room seemed laid open. I threw open the two windows and watched the fog float in sad, tumbling lumps. When it got too cold, I closed the windows, and though the room was wet from the fog and my papers and books were filmed with dampness, the perfume was still there unmistakably. I had Camilla's tam o shanter under my pillow. It too seemed drenched with the odor, and when I pressed it to my mouth, it was like my mouth and that woman's black hair. I sat in front of the typewriter, idly tapping the keys. As soon as I got started, I heard steps in the hallway and knew she was coming back. I turned off the lights quickly and sat in the darkness, but I was too late, for she must have seen the light under the door. She knocked, and I did not answer. She knocked again, but I sat still and puffed on a cigarette. Then she began to beat the door with her fists, and she called out that she would start kicking it and that she would kick it all night long unless I opened it. Then she started kicking it, and it made a terrible noise through that rickety hotel, and I rushed over and opened the door. Darling, she said, and she held open her arms. My God, I said, don't you think this has gone far enough? Can't you see I'm fed up? Why did you leave me, she asked. Why did you do that? I had another engagement. Darling, she said, why do you lie to me like that? Oh, nuts. She walked across the room and pulled the page from my typewriter again. It was full of all manner of nonsense, a few odd phrases, my name written many times, bits of poetry, but this time her face broke into a smile. How wonderful, she said. You're a genius, my darling. So talented. I'm awfully busy, I said. Will you please get out? It was as though she hadn't heard me. She sat on the bed, unbuttoned her jacket, and dangled her feet. I love you, she said. You're my darling, and you're going to love me. I said another time, not tonight, I'm tired. That saccharine odor came through. I'm not kidding, I said. I think you'd better go. I don't want to throw you out. I'm so lonely, she said. She meant that. Something was wrong with her. Twisted, gushing from her with those words, and I felt ashamed for being so harsh. All right, I said. We'll just sit here and talk for a while. I pulled up the chair and straddled it with my chin on the back looking at her as she snuggled on the bed. 
she wasn't as drunk as I thought. Something was wrong with her, and it was not alcohol, and I wanted to find out what it was. Her talk was madness. She told me her name, and it was Vera. She was a housekeeper for a rich Jewish family in Long Beach, but she was tired of being a housekeeper. She had come from Pennsylvania, fled across the country because her husband had been unfaithful to her. That day, she came down to Los Angeles from Long Beach. She had seen me in the restaurant in the corner of Olive Street in Second. She had followed me back to the hotel because my eyes had pierced her soul. But I couldn't remember seeing her there. I was sure I'd never seen her before. Having found out where I lived, she had gone to Solomon's and got drunk. All day she had been drinking, but it was only that she might become reckless and go to my room. I know how I revolt you, she said, and that you must know about my wounds and the horror my clothes conceal, but you must try to forget my ugly body because I'm really good at heart. I'm so good and I deserve more than your disgust. I was speechless. Forgive my body, she said. She put her arms out to me, the tears flowing down her cheeks. Think of my soul, she said. My soul is so beautiful. It can bring you so much. It is not ugly like my flesh. She was crying hysterically, lying on her face, her hands groping her dark hair, and I was helpless. I didn't know what she was talking about. Ah, dear lady, don't cry like that. You mustn't cry like that. And I took her hot hand and tried to tell her she was talking in circles. It was all so silly. Her talk, it was self-persecution. It was a lot of silly things, and I talked like that, gesturing with my hands, pleading with my voice, because you're such a fine woman and your body is so beautiful, and all this talk is an obsession, a childish phobia, a hangover from the mumps. So you mustn't worry and you mustn't cry because you'll get over it. I know you will. But I was clumsy and making her suffer even more because she was down in an inferno of her own creation. So far away from me that the sound of my voice made the hiatus seem worse. Then I tried to talk to her of other things and I tried to make her laugh at my obsessions. Look, lady, Arturo Bandini. He's got him, got a few himself. And from under the pillow, I drew out Camillo's tam o shanter with the little tassel on it. Look, lady, I've got them too. Do you know what I do, lady? I take this little black cap to bed with me, and I hold it close to me, and I say, oh, I love you. I love you, beautiful princess. And then I told her some more. Oh, I was no angel. My soul had a few twists and bends, all its own. So don't you feel so lonely, lady, because you've got lots of company. You've got Arturo Bandini. And he's got lots to tell you. And listen to this. Do you know what I did one night? Arturo confessing it all. Do you know the terrible thing I did? One night, a woman too beautiful for this world came along on wings of perfume, and I could not bear it. And who she was, I never knew. A woman in a red box and a pert little hat and Bandini trailing after her because she was better than dreams. Watching her enter Bernstein's fish grotto, watching her in a trance through a window swimming with frogs and trout, watching her as she ate alone and when she was through. Do you know what I did, lady? So don't you cry because you haven't heard anything yet because I'm awful, lady, and my heart is full of black ink. Me, Arturo Bandini. I walked right into Bernstein's fish grotto and I sat upon the very chair that she sat upon and I shuddered with joy and I fingered the napkin she had used and there was a cigarette butt with a stain of lipstick upon it. And do you know what I did, lady? You with your funny little troubles. I ate the cigarette butt, chewed it up, tobacco paper and all, swallowed it and I thought it tasted fine, better because she was so beautiful. And there was a spoon beside the plate. And I put it in my pocket. And every once in a while, I'd take the spoon out of my pocket and taste it. Because she was so beautiful. Love on a budget. A heroin free and for nothing. All for the black heart of Arturo Bandini. To be remembered through a window swimming with trout and frog legs. Don't you cry, lady. Save your tears for Arturo Bandini. Because he has his troubles, and they are all great troubles. And I haven't even begun to talk. But I could say something to you about a night on the beach with a brown princess. 
and her flesh without meaning, her kisses like dead flowers, odorless in the garden of my passion. But she was not listening. She staggered off the bed and she fell on her knees before me and begged me to tell her she was not disgusting. Tell me, she sobbed. Tell me I am beautiful like other women. Of course you are. You're really beautiful. I tried to lift her, but she clung to me frantically, and I couldn't do anything but try to soothe her. But I was so clumsy, so inadequate, and she was so far down in the depths beyond me, but I kept trying. Then she started again about her wounds, those ghastly wounds that they had wrecked her life. They had destroyed love before it came driven a husband from her and into another woman's arms. And all of this was fantastic to me and incomprehensible because she was really handsome in her own way. She was not crippled. She was not disfigured. And there were plenty of men who would give her love. She staggered to her feet and her hair had fallen to her face. The strands of hair pasted against her tear-soaked cheeks. Her eyes were blotchy and she looked like a maniac sodden with bitterness. I'll show you, she screamed. You'll see for yourself, you liar. Liar. With both hands, she jerked loose her dark shirt and it fell into a nest at her ankles. She stepped out of it and she was really beautiful in a white slip. And I said it. I said, but you're lovely. I told you. You were lovely. She kept sobbing as she worked at the clasp of her blouse. And I told her it wasn't necessary to take off anymore. She had convinced me beyond a doubt and there was no need for hurting herself further. No, she said, you're going to see for yourself. She couldn't re release the clasp at the back of the blouse and she backed toward me and told me to unclasp them. I waved my hand. For God's sake, forget about it, I said. You've convinced me. You don't have to do a strip act. She sobbed desperately and seized the thin blouse with her two hands and ripped it from her with one jerk. When she began to lift her slip, I turned my back and walked to the window because I knew then she was going to show me something unpleasant. And she began to laugh at me and shriek at me and point her tongue at my worried face. Yeah, yeah, see, you know already. You know all about them. I had to go through with it. And I turned around and she was nude except for hose and shoes. And then I saw the wounds. It was at the loins. It was a birthmark or something, a burn, a seared place, a pitiful, dry, vacant place where flesh was gone, where the thighs suddenly became small and shriveled and the flesh seemed dead. I closed my jaws and then I said, what, that? Is, is that just that? It's nothing, a mere trifle. But I was losing the words. I had to say them quickly or they would never form. It's ridiculous, I said. I hardly noticed it. You're lovely. You're wonderful. She studied herself curiously, not believing me. And then she looked at me again, but I kept my eyes on her face, felt the floating nausea of my stomach, breathed the sweetish, thickish odor of her presence, and I said again that she was beautiful. And the world slipped out like a whimper. So beautiful she was, a small girl, a virgin child so beautiful and rare to behold. And without a word and blushing, she picked up her slip and drew it over her head, a crooning and mysterious satisfaction in her throat. She was so shy all at once, so delighted, and I laughed to find the words coming easier now. And I told her again and again of her loveliness, of how silly she had been. But say it fast, Arturo, say it quickly, because something was coming up in me and I had to get out. So I told her I had to go down the hall a minute and for her to dress while I was gone. She covered herself and her eyes were swimming in joy as she watched me leave. I went down to the end of the hall to the landing of the fire escape and there I let go, crying and unable to stop because God was such a dirty crook, such a contemptible skunk. That's what he was for doing that thing to that woman. Come down out of the skies, you God. Come on down and I'll hammer your face all over the city of Los Angeles. You miserable, unpardonable prankster. If it wasn't for you, this woman would not be so maimed. And neither would the world. And if it wasn't for you, I could have had Camilo Lopez down at the beach. But no, you have to play your tricks. See what you have done to this woman. And to the love of Arturo Bandini for Camilo Lopez. 
And then my tragedy seemed greater than the woman's, and I forgot her. When I got back, she was dressed and combing her hair in front of a little mirror. The torn blouse was stuffed inside her coat pocket. She seemed so exhausted and yet so serenely happy. And I told her I'd walk downtown with her to the electric depot where she would catch a train for Long Beach. She told me, no, I wouldn't have to do that. She wrote out her address on a piece of paper. Someday you'll come to Long Beach, she said. I will wait a long time, but you'll come. At the door, we said goodbye. She held out her hand. It was so warm and alive. Alive. Goodbye, she said. Take care of yourself. Goodbye, Vera. There was no solitude after she left. There was no escape from the strange scent. I lay down, and even Camilla, who was a pillow with a tam o shanter for her head, seemed so far away, and I could not bring her back. Slowly, I felt myself filling with desire and sadness. You could have had her, you fool. You could have done what you pleased, just like Camilla, and you didn't do anything. All through the night, she mangled my sleep. I would wake up to breathe the sweet heaviness she had left behind and touch the furniture she had touched and think of the poetry she had recited. When I fell asleep, I had no recollection of it. For when I awoke, it was 10 in the morning and I was still tired, sniffing the air and thinking restlessly of what had happened. I could have said so much to her and she would have been so kind. I could have said, look, Vera, such and such is the situation and such and such happened. But if you could do such and such, perhaps it would not happen again. Because such and such a person thinks such and such about me. And it's got to stop. I shall die trying, but it's got to stop. So I sit around all day thinking about it. And I think about a few other Italians, Casanova and Cellini. And then I think about Arturo Bini and I have to punch myself in the head. I begin to wonder about Long Beach, and I say to myself that perhaps I should at least visit the place and maybe Vera to have a talk with her concerning a great problem. I think of that cadaverous place, the wound on her body, and try to find words for it, to fit it across the page of a manuscript. Then I say to myself that Vera, for all her flaws, might perform a miracle. And after the miracle is performed, a new Arturo Bandini will face the world. And Camilla Lopez, a Bandini with dynamite, is his body in volcanic fire in his eyes, who goes to this Camilla Lopez and says, See here, young woman, I have been very patient with you, but now I have had enough of your impudence. And you will kindly abide me by, by removing your clothes. These vagaries please me as I lie there and watch them unfold across the ceiling. One afternoon, I tell Mrs. Hargraves that I shall be gone for a day or so, Long Beach, some business, and I start out. I have Vera's address in my pocket, and I say to myself, Bandini, prepare yourself for the great adventure. Let the conquering spirit possess you. On the corner, I meet Helfrich, whose mouth is watering for more meat. I give him some money and he dashes into a butcher shop. Then I go down to the electric station and catch a red car for Long Beach. <laughs>